Modern desktop Intel processors, which utilize their hybrid architecture, have a unique and complex design, which has sparked a debate amongst enthusiasts and gamers. Many argue that by disabling eCores, you'll gain the best performance. Some express that they have experienced smoother performance by disabling hyperthreading, while some suggest that you should disable both. In this video, we're going to find out what's the best configuration if you're running one of these CPUs. Let's get into it. Hey, if you enjoy content like this, drop a like, make sure to subscribe, and smash that bell so you never miss another video. What's going on guys, Danny here, welcome back to the channel and I hope you've all been doing well. We're back and talking about Intel again, but don't worry, we're not going to be bashing on them as the YouTube tech community has been doing lately. For this video, we're going to be doing something more fun. We're going to be running through lots of gaming benchmarks to find out what yields the best gaming performance from a CPU which supports not just hyper-threading, but also smaller efficient cores. In the past, we've tested hyper-threading and e-cores separately on the channel, but what we haven't done before is pitted all the various configurations against each other in one series of benchmarks tests to figure out which configuration is the best when it comes to gaming performance. One of the reasons why I was prompted to make this video is because, as some of you may know, Intel's upcoming Arrow Lake processors are going to be dropping hyper-threading. That's right, hyper-threading, which has been a staple feature of Intel processors for over a decade, is going to be dropped in favor of eCores. Intel themselves haven't officially confirmed anything yet, but according to a previous presentation from their Lunar Lake architecture, which shares the same eCores, cores that will be featured on Arrow Lake, they have gotten a massive performance boost. Some of the benefits of getting rid of hyper-threading include, but not limited to, security, die space, and power efficiency. In the past, many of the exploits which were discovered were abusing the vulnerability from hyper-threading, so by getting rid of it, they're creating a more secure CPU as a result. Hyper-threading also results in higher power consumption, an area where Intel especially needed to improve upon when compared to the competition, so combining that with a node shrink should allow for immensely better performance per watt. Along with that, it does also reduce the requirement for die space. Now, I'm not going to be dwelling on this for too long because it's a topic that deserves its own video, and we have a lot of benchmarks to go through. The bottom line is that by going through these numbers, we'll have a better overview of how games behave once we disable a crucial part of the CPU, and then going forward for gamers, is going with just P cores and E cores without hyper-threading the best route? To begin with, I wanted to do a rundown of our test system specs. We're going to be testing this with my i9-13900K, which has its P cores running at 5.7 GHz, E cores are running at 4.6 GHz, and we have the cache clocked to 5 GHz. The CPU is paired with 48 GB of Patriot Viper Extreme 5 memory running at 7600 mega transfers, CL36 with tuned timings. The motherboard is an MSI Z790 Carbon Max Wi-Fi 2. The GPU is an MSI RTX 4090, which has a 3 GHz OC on the GPU core, and a plus 1500 offset on the memory. The games are also stored on a Corsair MP600 Pro LPX, which is a Gen 4 NVMe drive, and powering all the components is an EVGA 1000G3. For the operating system, we'll be testing with Windows 11 Pro, and I don't have the 24H2 update installed yet, and I didn't want to bother with the Insider Preview build because it requires you to deal with a bunch of telemetry shit that I just didn't want to go with. I'll just wait for the public release on that. However, I do have the Net Framework Windows update installed, which already includes much of the OS optimizations in it anyways, so just keep that in mind. Now as for testing, we'll be looking at four different configurations. The first is just regular stock with P cores enabled with hyper-threading and then E cores also enabled. The second configuration is P cores enabled without hyper-threading and E cores enabled. The third configuration is P cores enabled with hyper-threading and E cores disabled. And the last configuration is hyper-threading disabled and E cores disabled. We've tested them in 40 games at 1080p, so that will give us a better overview because it'll show how different games on different engines and APIs behave with the different configurations. So there was a lot of benchmarking involved, so I definitely appreciate it if you guys could share this video with anyone else who you think might be interested and hit that like button. Along with that, we're going to be going over all of the games tested, so buckle up because we've got a lot of benchmarks to go through. Starting us off, we have Starfield, and this game shows us it likes to have lots of threads and cores available to it, because when leaving hyper-threading enabled and e cores enabled, that gives us our best performance result, and turning off hyper-threading didn't reduce performance, but once e cores were disabled, we see performance does drop off, and then without hyper-threading and e cores disabled, performance drops significantly. 
Senua Saga Hellblade 2 is next, and we can see in this game it's fairly GPU bound for the most part, and the average FPS doesn't change at all across the different setups. It's margin of error, but we see how when hyper-threading is enabled, it does hurt the 1% lows a bit. Warhammer Space Marine 2 is up next, and in this title, our best result comes from having hyper-threading and E-Cores disabled. And then you can see once hyper-threading comes on, performance drops off slightly, and then the configuration with E-Cores disabled has significantly worse 1% lows a 13% drop from the best result versus the lowest. Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart is a very interesting game because you can see how all the different configurations provided us with the same performance except for when we disabled E-Cores and then had hyper-threading enabled. This configuration had substantially worse 1% lows and the average frame rate even dropped off quite a bit whereas the other configurations had no problem hitting that FPS cap. Returnal is up next and this game is another example of where disabling E-Cores results in better 1% lows, but the average FPS across the board is relatively the same. In Horizon Forbidden West, there's not much to say as the performance across all the configurations is about the same, but again we see slightly better 1% minimums without E-Cores. Ghost of Tsushima is another game that follows that trend, where average FPS isn't impacted by hyper-threading and E-Cores enabled, but our best result when it comes to 1% lows is without those being enabled, a 15% margin between the best and the worst results. Similarly, in Alan Wake 2, we can see how our average FPS across the board is the same, but once hyper-threading is disabled and E-Cores are disabled, this results in the best performance due to higher 1% lows. I'm glad I included this configuration because previously we had only looked at hyper-threading disabled and then E-Cores disabled, and I was only going to include those two versus stock, but then I thought it would be interesting to see how the CPU does in gaming without those technologies enabled, and this leads us to seeing some very interesting results. In Remnant 2, we notice that performance in this title is the best without hyper-threading enabled, as those configurations produce the best results, and it also clearly likes having the E-Cores enabled. Now, when it comes to just having 8 P-Cores enabled without hyper-threading, this doesn't always result in the best performance. The Last of Us Part 1 is a game that's quite heavily multi-threaded, and it really shows, as the first three configurations all yielded the same performance, while the last configuration without E-Cores and hyper-threading played awfully with terrible 1% lows. Marvel Spider-Man Remastered is another game which shows us it likes as many threads as possible because our best performance comes from our stock configuration where we have E-Cores and hyper-threading enabled. Disabling hyper-threading sees a bit of a performance drop-off, and then when E-Cores are disabled, it reduced the 1% lows significantly, and then having the 8 P-Cores and 8 threads brings the average FPS even lower. Gears 5, on the other hand, shows the best performance comes from when we have hyper-threading disabled and E-Cores disabled. Our worst result comes from when hyper-threading is enabled, but E-Cores are still disabled. For Total War Warhammer 3, I decided to change things up a bit and use the Mirrors of Madness benchmark as this scene has a lot more troops on scene, there's more particle effects and spells being thrown around, and overall it's just more chaotic, and that shows from the performance. Having lots of cores and threads available for the CPU benefits this game, and that's evident here as disabling hyper-threading and e-cores results in the worst performance. Forza Horizon 5 is another interesting title. You can see how with our stock configuration and when we just have hyper-threading disabled, for performance is about the same. Having E-Cores disabled but hyper-threading on results in reduced 1% lows, but our best result seems to be just having 8 P-Cores by themselves. In Final Fantasy XIV Dawn Trail, performance is pretty much the same across the board, with some minor differences but really nothing notable. In Red Dead Redemption 2, our best result comes from having hyper-threading disabled and leaving the E-Cores enabled, but overall the performance from the other configurations we saw was relatively close. In The Witcher 3 next-gen update, we see that the average FP from the different setups is basically the same, but the 1% lows are the best when we have hyper-threading disabled. Then disabling E-Cores on top of that provides us with better lows. I always find it somewhat comical when talking about a game like Counter-Strike with ridiculously high FPS because regardless of the setup, you'll perceive the same experience. Although, for the sake of the comparison, our worst performance came from our stock configuration where we see a 6% drop in average FPS when compared to the best result and 8% for the 1% lows. Middle-Earth Shadow of War 
War is one of the older games on our list here, but I like to throw these games in there to see if we get any interesting results. But overall, I don't have anything to say here as the performance across the different configurations is about the same. No noticeable changes. War Thunder is another older game on the list, but one that is still played a lot as evident by its place on the Steam charts. Though when it comes to performance, it's another game that doesn't really care too much about hyper-threading or e-cores, probably due to it being primarily single-threaded. In Halo Infinite, all the configurations will offer you great performance, but if you're someone who's looking to compete with the smoothest 1% lows, then disabling hyper-threading and e-cores yields the best results. Forspoken is next, and while I'm sure everyone considers this game to be a major flop, I do like to test it every now and then as it is quite demanding on hardware, and what always impresses me is just how fast direct storage is. You press load game and then boom, within a second you're loaded into the world. That's something I wish every game adopts going forward. As for performance, we're basically looking at margin of error stuff, nothing noteworthy here. Metro Exodus Enhanced Edition is a title that I did have to test with ray tracing enabled as it comes on by default. With that said, we do see some interesting results and this game shows us it really doesn't like the e-cores as both configurations without e-cores enabled offer in higher average FPS and slightly better 1% lows. Resident Evil 4 Remake is the next game on our list and with this game we see our best performance results comes from having hyper threading and e-cores disabled. There's a 13% performance improvement when we disable e-cores and hyper threading. Atomic Heart on our list of games shows performance gradually improves as we start disabling stuff but overall the performance gains aren't anything significant to impact a performance in any noticeable way. Doom Eternal is another one of those games where you'd be hard pressed to find any noticeable differences between any of these configurations. With that said, we do see that when we disable hyper-threading and e-cores, the 1% lows are significantly better than the other results. We're looking at an 11% margin when compared to the worst result. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is also another older title on the list, but the devs did a good job with this one as it shows how well it scales with hardware and that's evident here. That's why I like to use it. We can see our best result comes from having e-cores and hyper-threading enabled. The Rift Breaker also shows us a similar story where we see better performance with the configurations that have e-cores and hyper-threading enabled. There's a massive 20% improvement in regards to the 1% lows when comparing the stock configuration against not having hyper-threading and e-cores enabled. Moving on and we have Lies of P and I finally got around to playing this earlier this year and I gotta say it's become one of my favorite games. If it wasn't for Baldur's Gate 3, I'd say this would have been my game of the year for 2023. Seriously, if you're a fan of Souls-like games, do not sleep on this. And on top of that, the devs did a great job with optimizing this game. It runs like a dream and I had no complaints at all. Either of these configurations would offer a stellar gaming experience, but it's when we have hyper-threading disabled and e-cores off where we attain the best performance. Speaking of Souls-like and action games, we have Black Myth Wukong, which took the gaming market by storm this past month, and for good reasons. It looks amazing, has excellent and fun combat, and some epic boss fights. Performance from all configurations is about the same when it comes to the average FPS, but 1% lows did take a bit of a hit when e-cores were disabled and hyper-threading was left on. Hitman 3 is another game that exhibits the same sort of behavior. Average FPS overall is the same across all the configurations, but when we disable the e-cores but still retain hyper-threading, it performed the worst. Turning e-cores on improves the 1% lows by around 11%. A Plague Tale Requiem is a game that shows it prefers to have many threads and cores available to it, as we can see that disabling hyper-threading and e-cores results in performance dropping off, where we see deltas of around 12% for the average FPS and 21% for the 1% lows. Baldur's Gate 3 shows us that all configurations offer the same performance, but the average FPS and 1% lows do improve a bit once hyper-threading and e-cores are disabled. With Hogwarts Legacy, there's a couple of things happening here. Our average FPS results are better, though not by much, when we disable the e-cores. However, our 1% lows are best once we have e-cores enabled, a delta of around 18% when compared to the stock configuration. In Cyberpunk 2077, which is a game that also is quite heavily multi-threaded, we can see the average FPS across the board is the same, but our best results come from having just P-Cores enabled with hyper-threading enabled. Now, I'm still using Modern Warfare 2 2022 in my list here as opposed to Modern Warfare 3, simply because I don't own the third one because I thought it was just a garbage game, and I mean, it's basically the same game anyway. I will replace this eventually with Black Ops 6, which from my experience with the beta, is a pretty fun game. With that said, when it comes to performance, I saw this game yielded the best results with our stock configuration, but 
having hyper threading off with e cores enabled still performed well. However, what I wanted to point out was that for some reason, disabling hyper threading and e cores just decimated our performance. I don't know why I triple checked the settings, but it just doesn't perform well once we disable e cores and hyper threading. So once again, I am happy I included this configuration because I know there are some people who swear that, you know what, they disable hyper threading and e cores, they just want 8p cores by themselves and they think that's the best way to play their games and clearly we're seeing that's not the case here. A similar experience is observed in Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord and this game for my testing will utilize all threads and cores available to it but with that said the performance improvements drop off so just having 8p cores and 16e cores provided us with the best performance. Now in Watch Dogs Legion we can see that it benefits from having hyper threading enabled as we see the average FPS improve with those configurations. Assassin's Creed Valhalla shows us the same performance across all the configurations so let's move on. The last game we have on our list is Far Cry 6 and overall performance is also the same. There is a bit of performance regression with hyper threading enabled without e cores but it's really nothing to write home about. Now that we've gone over our 40 games let's take a look at our 40 game average and the results here show us that overall performance across all the configurations is about the same but for the sake of highlighting our winner performance is the best with hyper threading disabled and e cores enabled. With that said, I think a 40 game average graph does oversimplify things and you do still have to take into consideration the game by game results individually because we saw some games that do not like e cores, we saw some games that perform better with hyper threading enabled and some perform better with all of that off. However, if I was to make a recommendation, I would suggest that either leave it at stock, meaning keep hyper threading enabled and e cores enabled, or if you want to save power and really be able to maximize an undervolt, then run your system without hyper threading enabled. In fact, that's how I've been running my own personal rig since I got it. I turned off hyper threading on my 14900K because multi threading performance was already good enough for me, and this helped me push my undervolt further that helped me with temps, and I guess it played a huge role in my chip not experiencing any of the crashing and degradation issues others have faced. My chip doesn't even spike past 1.42 volts. Now, I'm not saying that this is a definitive solution for those who are having problems, and I'm also not saying that you should be disabling a feature that you paid money for. I think the out of the box configuration should work just fine without any problems for everyone but this is just a choice that I've made for my chip and it's helped me tune my system the way I want it to run. The other reason why I suggest that you'd be fine with disabling hyper threading and leaving e cores on is because while this configuration did lose sometimes to others without e cores the difference wasn't that big. Meanwhile, we saw some games just absolutely have their performance decimated once we disabled the e-cores along with hyper-threading. I'm just speculating here, but I think this probably played a major role in Intel foregoing hyper-threading for their future architectures. The vast majority of games perform just fine without it, and considering the next-gen e-cores will get a significant performance uplift and IPC uplift, they will make up for that loss. The other benefit is that they can focus on just optimizing the p-core itself for better performance per watt, latency, and with less on-die space needed, they can perhaps utilize this space for something else like more cash, or they'll just use it to save on manufacturing costs. Either way, the benefits from not having it outweigh the ones with it. So that'll wrap it up for this one. I hope you guys found something valuable from all the testing that I did. I know for me, it gave me the assurance I was looking for. I think we'll be looking back on this video once we see Arrow Lake rolls out and do some testing with those processors. I'm looking forward to them to see what they bring to the table with their new designs. For now though, we'll touch base in the next video. If you guys found this video to be informative and entertaining, then leave a like. Let me know your thoughts and comments down below. Be sure to check out the video description for cool links and ways to support the channel, such as using my Amazon affiliate link. And if you're interested in seeing more content like this, then consider subscribing, I'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for watching, take care and I'll see you in the next one.